The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. Bob was 47 years old when he had his quadruple bypass. After the surgery was done, he'd gone through the basic recovery, his doctor sat down with him and just had an honest conversation. He said, Bob, you need to lose 80 pounds. You need to get more active and do more physically and begin to exercise. And you've got to completely renovate the way you eat and the way you've been eating for your whole life. And if you don't, there's a good chance that your next heart attack will be your last. You got the point, Bob? Yes, doctor, I got the point. And Bob followed those instructions precisely to a T, to the finest detail, without missing a bit, for two whole weeks. <laughs> and then he shifted back to life as usual. And almost to the day, six months later, Bob had another heart attack. And the doctor was right. It was his last one. He said, I didn't come to church to hear a depressing story. Well, let me tell you another one. <laughs> Susan is 28. She's called into HR at her work, a job that she loves. And HR says, Susan, this is the third time we've had to have you come in. You're a great worker. You work really hard. You do your work well, but your mouth is getting you in trouble. You are gossiping. You are slandering. You are negative, and you are creating division in our workplace. This is the third warning. The next time you're called into HR, it will be to let you go. So please, please change the way you speak. Three weeks later, she's back in again. And she loses her third job in three years for the same pattern and reasons. You say, I don't like that story. That's discouraging. Let me try another one. <laughs> Daniel is 15. He's a freshman in high school. He's sitting in the principal's office with his parents, and the principal is saying, Daniel's a smart kid, he's got incredible potential, but he's failing over half of his classes. The principal says, it's hard in our world today to actually hold someone back into the same grade. We just don't do that much anymore. But if Daniel keeps performing like he is, he will be a freshman for a second year next year. You want to take a wild guess how that story ends? Daniel does his freshman year again the second year, and halfway through, he drops out. Why would your pastor stand up here and tell you three depressing, discouraging stories? Because those stories set the table for a little three-chapter book in the Old Testament in the Minor Prophets called Nahum. Nahum is speaking into a situation to a group of people who have got their warning. They've been told with clarity and they've ignored the warning, and they're now going to suffer and experience the consequences. Nahum is one of the 12 minor prophets. He is prophesying in a time, in a situation that, that is in the ancient world. He's prophesying about 650 BC, but, but to, understand, to understand Nahum's prophecy, you have to understand the people he's prophesying to, the city of Nineveh. The city of Nineveh was brutal, pagan and bloodthirsty. This is the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. And a hundred years earlier, in 750 BC, God had sent another prophet to Nineveh. His name was Jonah. If you weren't here last year for the first half of the Minor Prophets series, you can go online and you can listen to the message on Jonah. But God, God sent Jonah a hundred years earlier. And Jonah didn't want to go to the city of Nineveh and prophesy because they were cruel, they were vicious, they were bloodthirsty. They had damaged every nation around them. Some people would say that the Assyrians weren't just in the ancient world, one of the most brutal, brutal people at war. They would say in the history of all the world. When the Assyrians came into an area and took over, they left nothing behind and nothing alive. They were brutal and vicious. And in 750 BC, God sent Jonah 
to call them to repent and to seek God and to be forgiven. And Jonah didn't want to go because he wanted them to be judged. He didn't want them to know God's grace. They were cruel and vicious and brutal. And yet God said, Jonah, go. And they repented and found hope. And Jonah was angry. He didn't want them to repent. He didn't want them to know grace. But they repented, and God forgave them and loved them. But here's the problem. They did not take God seriously and share with the next generation. A hundred years earlier, back in 750 B.C., when Jonah came, they repented and they responded, but they didn't pass that legacy on to their children and their children's children. So by the time of Nahum, they're just as bad, just as pagan, just as violent, just as vicious, just as godless as they had been before, maybe more so. So now Nahum comes and speaks. And he says, now your time is over. So he came with a message of judgment almost 100 years after Jonah, mid-600s B.C. And in 612 B.C., Nineveh and the Assyrian nation fell to the Babylonians. You'll see a map up here. What happened was the Babylonians and the Medes came in, and this is part of, part of you know, world history, and Nineveh fell in 612 B.C. It was prophesied by Nahum. Nahum said, you've had your warning. You've had your quadruple bypass. You've had your third meeting with HR. You've had your meeting with the principal. And you just kept going in the same direction. You repented for a while, but you slid back into those same patterns again. And, and, and the cry of the heart of Nahum is a cry that says, pay attention. Take God seriously. And take his warnings seriously. When we look at Nahum, we get this, this picture of this prophet who's really prophesying and giving us a picture of God. Nahum, the, the, the major lessons we learn from Nahum are really about the character of God and who God is. And when you read the Bible, what you discover is God is who he says he is, and it's not up to us to decide. We can't decide, well, I like this characteristic of God, but I don't like that characteristic. That's not up for us. God is God, and we have to understand who he is and know him and follow him. So I want to share four major lessons from this minor prophet of Nahum. Each lesson is about the character and the person of God. So here's major lesson number one. God is a just judge. The God that we gather to worship today is a God who is absolutely just, and he is a judge, and he will judge, and he does judge, he has judged, and he will judge. And some people say, well, I don't like that. I want, I, want a, I want a God who gives me gifts and makes me feel good, and who never judges. That's the God I want. But remember, it's not up to you to decide who God is. The word of God tells us who he is. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. But here's the question. Would you really want God to not be just? We, what would our world be like if we removed justice? Judges. And those, those who hold boundaries. It, it'd be nice to think... That, you know, well, human beings by nature are good and sweet and will just always do the kindest thing. And you can feel that way when you look at your two-month-old granddaughter and say, oh, she's sweet, she couldn't hurt anybody. But she's, I mean, she's only two months old. Give her a few years. <laughs> Same with your grandson. I mean, say, you know, as human beings, we, we need boundaries. We have a world that's so broken. In our world, there's human trafficking. There are people who sell children and women and men for money for the pleasure of other people. That happens in our world. And, and there's something in our hearts should, that should say, that's not just, that's wrong. We should cry out, God, do something. God, you're a just God. You can't look the other way. And, and this is what Nahum tells us, is that this God that we worship is a just judge. Look at Nahum chapter one, verse two. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. You go, whoa, that's kind of heavy. Do I want to think about God that way? We better think about God that way because that's part of who God is. That's part of his character. And I praise God that he's a just God. But I also praise God for Jesus. Jesus. Because God will judge, God will judge all sin and all wrong. But for those who've come to the cross and received Jesus, Jesus took our judgment, he took the wrath we, des we deserved, he took the punishment that was supposed to be on us, and Jesus took it on himself. That's goodness, that's love, that's the grace of God. 
but God is a just judge and he will deal with sin. I, I question sometimes my ability to know what's right and wrong and what's just, but I don't question God's. I sometimes wonder about God's timing. I mean, if, if I was God, I'd say, God, I see some of this stuff happening in the world. I'd say, God, if I was you, I would just, you know, deal with it, you know? But I'm not God. That's not up to me. And praise God, I'm not God. And praise God, you're not God, right? But God is a just judge. And we have to acknowledge this and say, that's part of the character of this God we gather to worship. But a second major lesson from Nahum, from, from this minor prophet, and again, about the character of God, is that God is patiently powerful. God is all powerful, but God is shockingly patient. I look at my own life and say, God, you're so patient with me. I look at our world and say, God, you're so patient. There's things that if it was up to you or me, it'd be dealt with right now. But God wants people to come to him to repent of him. If this is the God who would say to the Ninevites 100 years earlier, before Nahum's time, even though they were brutal and bloodthirsty, I want to give you a chance to repent. And when they did, he showed grace to that generation. That's the heart of our God. He's patiently powerful. Look at Nahum 1.3. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. God's slowness in acting is not a sign that he's not powerful. He is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. God will deal with sin. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. In the book of Nahum, God is speaking to the city of Nineveh and to the people of Assyria. He's saying, I called you to repent, and you did for a time, but then you went back to the same patterns and the same behaviors, and the time for repenting is over. Judgment's coming. Just judgment that they brought upon themselves because of their actions and their choices and how they lived as a nation. God says, I've been patient, but I'm also powerful. And in, in, the book of, in the book of Nahum, you'll notice if you read it, and I, I encourage you today to read it. Even though it's a tough read because it's dealing with the reality of judgment, it takes about 15 minutes. It's three short chapters. And in the, in, in the book of Nahum, there's both this reality of judgment coming on Nineveh and the Assyrians, but God is also speaking to Judah, his people, that southern kingdom of the two tribes, and saying that after you've gone through a time of exile, I'm going to restore you, and I've got blessings planned for you, and I'm going to be patient with you and lead you forward. There's hope in the midst of the reality of judgment. Major lesson number three from Nahum. He is a good God. Our God, the God we gather to worship today, is a just judge. He's patiently powerful, but he's also a good God. Look at Nahum 1.7. The Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. When you put your trust in him, he cares for you. He watches over you. God is good. And for some people, they say, wait a minute, God, I can't think of a God who's, who's a judge, and you're telling me he's good. You're saying he's a judge, he's going to judge people for their sin, but you're saying he's good. I can't put those together. Here's the reality. He can't be truly good and not judge. I mean, think about it. If God is truly good, and there's people human trafficking and, and selling people, other human beings... A good God doesn't just go, no big deal. A good God says, I will deal with that. The Bible's clear that God will deal with all sin. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus died on the cross. When, when Jesus, God, entered human history, Jesus, the, the Son of God, came into human history, God with us, Emmanuel, he lived a life with no sin and no wrong. When he was nailed to the cross, he was not punished for, 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 for his sin. He was punished for my sins and yours. And when Jesus hung on that cross and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The just judgment of God for our sins was placed on Jesus. And he took our punishment and he took the wrath and he was separated from the Father so that we wouldn't have to be. That's a good God. That is a loving God. Because God's just, he can't ignore sin. But because he's good, he paid the price for our sin. So the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we're offered forgiveness for all who will come to the cross and receive Jesus. Can somebody say amen? amen. That's good news. That's a good and loving and amazing God. He is a just judge, but he is a good God. Major lesson number four from Nahum. 
Our God is tenaciously truthful. When God says, I will do this, when God promises, God keeps his promises, always, always. And when God says, I promise, sometimes that's wonderful, and sometimes that's a little scary. Sometimes God says, I promise, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Ooh, I like that one. When God says, I will pour out wrath upon sin, I promise, we go, ooh, I don't know if I like that one. But because God is tenaciously truthful when he says something, it is the truth, and that's how things will go. I was thinking about that, and what came to my mind was raising three boys, and our boys are now all in their late 20s, uh, into early 30s, and and raising our three boys. They knew that when I looked at them and said, I promise, when I said to my boys, I promise, they knew that I would do everything in my power to follow through. So if I said to them, hey, listen, on Friday... We're going to go to Houseman's Old Fashioned Ice Cream on 84th Street in Byron Center where our boys grew up. We're going to go out and get ice cream together on Friday. And if I said, I promise, they'd go, oh, they get excited. Why? Because when I said I promise, they knew it was going to happen. Short of me having a heart attack and being in the hospital or something, I mean, I was, we're, gonna, we're going. If dad said I promise, and I, and I tried to live a life where I, when I said I promise, I made sure I followed through. So sometimes when I said I promise, that's like good news. Oh, this is going to be great. We're going to Houseman's for ice cream. But sometimes when I said I promise, it wasn't as encouraging. So... In the wild imagination that you might have, imagine one of my boys doing something naughty. Uh, it happened on occasion. And getting caught. So I would say this. You were on restriction for the next week. Now, in our home, restriction wasn't go into your room with all your toys and electronic games and play video games and talking. That's all techno- technology was shut off. And it was kind of slave labor camp around the house. Our yard never looked better than when our boys were in trouble. You know, it, it's cleaning the yard, it's dusting. It's, and they would work, schoolwork, finish the schoolwork, and now you're, now you're working for dad. And so, so they had friends where the, the parents were like, you're going to be on restriction for a month. And two days later, their friend's out goofing off doing stuff. And I'd be like, wait, they said they were on restriction for a month. Oh, well, they whined and their parent caved and they're no longer on restriction. So I would look at my son and I would say this. You're on restriction for the next seven days. I promise I will not change my mind. And you know what? They would go like this. <sighs> Why? Because they knew. They're, they wouldn't even ask me. Why? Because I'm not changing my mind. I promise. I'm not. So sometimes, you get the point, sometimes the promise is, ooh, good, this is wonderful. Sometimes the promise is, ooh, that's tough. But God is tenaciously truthful. So when he speaks, he speaks the truth always and he follows through. Maybe not in my exact timing or the way I would see it happening, but God always keeps his promises. And so, in Nahum 1.14 and 3.9, we hear these words about Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian nation, and what's gonna happen. And this is what God says. The Lord has given a command concerning Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. Your nation is gonna cease to exist. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. Your pagan worship is going to come to an end. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. And then chapter 3, verse 19. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you will clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? Every nation around Assyria had felt their brutal warfare and their hostility. And he says, the nations are going to clap and be thrilled when you go down because you're that bad. It was just a century earlier that Jonah came and spoke a word of hope and they repented, but something had happened in that time frame and now they turned back to where they were before. And so here's the question. Who's to blame Who's to blame? Is it Bob's fault that he had another heart attack and dropped over and his life ended? Is it it Bob's fault? No, or is it the doctor's fault? Well, I think it's Bob's fault. The doctor was clear. Change your eating patterns, change or do these things, and he didn't follow through. Who's to blame with Susan in the HR department at her third job in three years? Who's to blame? Well, can I tell you what? Susan's probably going to blame the HR department and her boss. It's their fault. They were mean. They only gave me three warnings. But it's not their fault. It's her fault. They sat her down. They put it in writing. There's three reports already in your HR file. You have this pattern. You've already, they don't know it, but she's already lost her other two jobs before that because of the same things. But you know what Susan's going to probably do? 
She's going to blame them. She's going to tell her family and friends and everyone. She says, oh, it's really their fault. She's not going to own it. But who should own that? She should own it all. But our human nature is, is to run from those things. Whose fault is it, Daniel or the principal that Daniel went back to his freshman year again? Well, Daniel can blame the whole world, but he was given the chance. Whose fault is it? Nineveh and the people of Assyria are a holy and just God. And we're too quick to want to blame someone else instead of look at our own hearts and look at our own lives and grapple with that. So I want to ask the question, if, if, uh, if Nahum could be here today and if Nahum could sit with us and just share from his journey, from what he learned, what would Nahum share with us today? What message would Nahum bring to you and to me? And if you could have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if you would really listen to this prophet, what word would he bring to you and what would he say? The first thing I think he would say is this. What would the prophet say to you? He would say this. Share your faith and the truth of God's grace with the next generation or the consequences could be more serious than you think. Nahum watched and he knew that under Jonah's preaching, the Syrian nation and the city of Nineveh repented and God showed grace. But something happened. They didn't tell the next generation about this good and forgiving God. Not with enough clarity for them to hold on to it. So the next generation slid into all the same old patterns. I think Nahum would say to you, hey, that next generation, your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, your nephews, are you pointing them to Jesus? Are you telling them about the hope of Jesus? I think if Nahum could look at our world right now, he'd say this. Hey, I know you spend 15 hours a week sitting on sidelines cheering on sports teams. That's okay. But do you read the word of God with your kids? Do you teach the word of God to your grandchildren, to your nieces and nephews? I think if Nahum could look at our world, he'd say, hey, I, I know you're all about your kids' academics or their involvement in the arts, and that's wonderful. That's great. But do you pray with your kids? I mean, do you get on your knees next to them, next to their bed? Do you, do you talk to Jesus together? I think if Nahum could look at our generation, he'd say, you're always one generation away from losing the faith. And he watched one generation not pass on their faith to the next. I think Nahum would say to us, man, take your role. If you're a Christian and you have influence on the next generation, whether you're a youth sponsor or a middle school helper or work with our children or whether you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, and share your story of faith with the next. Do, do you tell your stories of what God's doing in your life with the next generation so they can see in your face and your eyes, God is real. I know Jesus. I love Jesus. Do you, do you share with the next generation? Or do you just hope that they'll catch the Jesus thing? Because I'll tell you something. They won't just catch it, not in this world. They're gonna catch a lot of other stuff first. There's a lot of things coming at kids. And I think Nahum would say, you need to be intentional about passing faith to the next generation. And I think we spend a sliver of our time with the next generation on faith and a bunch of the, the pie of our time on lots of other stuff that might be important, but it's not as important as a walk with Jesus. I think Nahum is challenging us to pass to the next generation so they don't wander away. What would the prophet say to you and to me? I think he would say this, takes God's words and warnings seriously. I think Nahum would say, take the words of God and take the warnings of the Holy Spirit of God seriously. Because the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts and says it's time to change that behavior, to change that pattern, to repent of that, to turn away from it. And so often, we just keep on going. And praise God if you're a Christian. You're not saved by how good you are. I'm not saved by how good I am. We're saved by the grace of Jesus. But we are saved to live for Jesus, not just to keep walking down the wrong paths. As I was praying about this, I was really, I was seeking the Lord, I was praying, I said, Lord, are there, are there specific things you want me to share with Shoreline? Are there specific things you want me to share when it comes to really searching your heart? What's, where's the Holy Spirit speaking? Where are we feeling conviction, but maybe not acting on that conviction? And, and God put three words on my heart. I wrote them down and I want to share those words with you and I want you just to ask, is God speaking to you and your heart in one of these areas? I had someone come, come up to me after the first service and say, God spoke to me in all three areas. 
God's been speaking to me and wants to, and I can just tell you, speaking to me in all three areas. So I want to give you three words and let the Holy Spirit just speak to your heart for a moment. Here's the first word, impurity. A lack of purity in your heart and your life. The word is impurity. Just, just quiet your heart for a minute before the Lord. And just ask, Spirit of God, have you been talking to me and speaking to me and convicting me about impurity in my heart, impurity in my life, in my words and my thoughts and my behavior? And if God's been speaking to you and convicting you, and you've just continued on doing things the way you were doing them before, talk to him about that and ask for the strength to turn away from those things. Is impurity something God's been speaking to you about? As I prayed, the second word that came to my heart was dishonesty. Dishonesty. I think we live in a world where dishonesty is just the way things are. But has God been speaking to you about being more honest and, and truthful with your words? Has God been speaking to you about dishonesty in relationships or in the workplace, whatever it is? So just quiet your heart again and, and say, Spirit of God, if you've been speaking to me about dishonesty in my life, patterns in my life where I'm not an honest person, will you speak and convict me and show me how to live in a different way. Just talk to God about that for a moment. The third word that came to my heart as I prayed was this word, laziness. Laziness. Has the Holy Spirit been convicting you that you're wasting time, that you're kind of frittering away your time? And again, doing, we're not saved by what we do, but when we're truly saved by God's grace, we're saved to live in a new way. And if God's been convicting you about laziness, about wasting time on things that just don't make any impact on the world around you, that don't advance the work of Jesus in any way, if God's been speaking, just quietly say to God right now, God, if, if there's been, you've been convicting me of laziness, just show me that and let me make a decision to live in a different way. And just talk, take a minute and talk to Jesus about that. What would the prophet say to you and to me? One last thought. I believe that Nahum would say this. In Christ, judgment is covered. But discipline from a holy God is a very serious thing. I think that Nahum would say to us, we're on the other side of the cross. If you're a Christian, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, judgment is gone. You will not be judged. But, I think Nahum would say, but your God is a loving heavenly father. And the Bible says that, that, that God disciplines those he loves. I was sitting in a restaurant with, I don't even remember which one, one of my three boys was sitting in a restaurant with one of my boys, and in a nearby table, there was this parent and a child that was just out of control. This child was just rude and out of line and misbehaving, and the parent was doing nothing. First thing that ran through my, my mind was, give me five minutes for that kid. And then I thought, okay, that does not allowed. Um, but... That's the pastor in me coming out, right? But, but I, as I sat there, I'm watching this unfold. And what I didn't realize is that my son was watching it also. And finally, my son leaned over to me and said this. He said, why doesn't that parent love their child? And I realized, he looked in and saw that parent didn't love their child enough to do something, to discipline them and help them not become a rotten punk that they were acting like. And my son said, why doesn't that parent love their child? And I thought, you know, they, I said, you're right, you're right. That parent doesn't love their child enough to help them not behave that way. They're just looking the other way and ignoring it completely. God loves us too much to let us keep going down the wrong path. If you're a Christian, judgment is not yours. Heaven is your home, and there's no thing you have to do to be good enough to receive God's grace. That's a gift from God. Through Jesus, he died on the cross. He paid the price. Praise God. But I think that Nahum would say, God, God would tell you, you're not under judgment, but I love you so much, I will discipline you if you keep going down a road where I'm warning and warning and warning and warning. And don't be surprised when God lovingly disciplines you. I think Nahum would say, you don't want to come under God's loving discipline. It's better to repent and do the right thing now. Not to get saved, but because you are saved and you know the grace of Jesus. These three little chapters in the book of Nahum are often missed, but incredibly powerful. 
And I want to pray and ask God to speak to our hearts, to see him as he is. And if God's speaking to us about something that we need to repent of or turn away from, we'll hear his voice. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> oh God, we thank you that you are a just God, but you are a good God. And that through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and his resurrection, our sins can be washed away and we are not under judgment. We live under grace. But God, we also thank you that you are a loving heavenly father. And you don't look the other way. You don't ignore our sins and, and you don't let us behave badly and ignore it. You care about us and you want the best for us. So God, search our hearts and remind us of, of the greatness of your love and the power of your grace, but the call that you have on our lives to follow you, to live for you, not to get saved, but because we're loved by you, we want to live for you. So fill us with power and fill us with strength. And Lord, when you need to, discipline us in love to make us more like Jesus. We pray this in his name.